Go over there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, welcome back everyone to the humorous speech competition. Just a couple of points. Tim is videotaping this and it will probably go up on YouTube and at some set, conference at some yes. stage. He missed a key Eric's opening speech apart of it and he's asking if anyone has actually videotaped it, they would contact him afterwards because he likes to try to take that from you. But not without to live without it. And uh, one other point, in terms of the speakers, do the people in the back of the room have difficulty with the hearing? I had a few comments. It's the room. Right. It's the room, right. It's, yeah, so terrible I'll, acoustics. Maybe if it's okay with you, I'll take an executive decision that if the speaker actually wants to come as far as here, we did bring from that the, yes. the, the impact over here, but the speaker wants to come as far as here so they can project better, we're, we're more than happy to do that. So there won't be any disqualification for going out outside the boundaries. You could actually move everybody up forward, too. <laughs> no, if you want to start talking to the Saints. logic is not part of this competition. Please, this is a humorous competition. Um, we're a group of five profits, so if any of you want to move up, you're more than welcome to do it. If you, please think about this. If you touch your cell phone during the break, please look at it again and make sure that you haven't actually turned to silence or turned on. What I'm going to do as well. Okay. We're now starting the humorous speech competition. I will give you the order of speakers. They've all been briefed, as you know, it's five to seven minute time. By the time we're back there, I go over the 30 seconds beyond the seven minutes, we will be disqualified, but there will be no announcements made about this qualification. So, the speaking order for the speech contest, we've got five contestants. Contestant number one is Cassie Moore. Cassie Moore. C A S S I E is how Cassie's called. Cassie Moore. Contestant number two, Sandra Stein. Sandra Stein. Contestant number three, Philip Seaborg. Philip Seaborg. Contestant number four, Sean Kelly. Sean Kelly. Contestant number five, David Williams. David Williams. So, let's rock and roll. West Division Humor Speech Contest. Test number one. Cassie Moore. The Dead Sea Mud Rat. I wish I were dead. The Dead Sea Mud Rat. I wish I were dead. Cassie Moore. Oh, 
Let's roll over there and get on table. Whoa! In the brochures, there were sheets, there were coverage. I am not getting on that table naked. <laughs> so she hands me a towel. <laughs> <laughs>
must come to an end. Resort Spa Hotel, $211.50. Dead Sea Mud Wrap, Swiss Shower, plus tip, $450. Wine, $85.74. Post-traumatic stress disorder, inflicted <laughs> by Helga, priceless. <laughs> Speaker number two, Sandra Stein. The ladies' room. The ladies' room, Sandra Stein. Gentlemen, this is sort of geared a little bit more toward you, but I bet every one of you, sometime in your life, has gone shopping with your woman and asked her this question, what on earth takes you so long? Mm. Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, dignitaries, and other guests, I'm going to show you what takes a woman so long. Gosh, it's time to go on. You know what, I, I gotta go to the bathroom before I, before I get into that traffic.
one drop. Lesson number three, Philip Seaborg, The Wedding of Lisa and Phil. The Wedding of Lisa and Phil. Philip Seaborg. Almost 200 years ago, the British poet Lord Byron wrote in his poem entitled Don Juan, The Truth is Stranger Than Fiction. My wedding was a good example of that. My wedding, in fact, I believe could be made into a good movie. It had drama, comedy, and more than a couple twists and turns along the way. Master Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and honored guests. I had been dating Lisa since the spring of 1980. And in 1983, I finally had gotten up the courage to ask her to marry me. So I went to the Holland's Jeweler store in Woodfield Shopping Center and bought a diamond engagement ring. A couple days later, a co-worker came up to me at work and said, so, I hear you're planning on asking Lisa to marry you. I couldn't believe it. I hadn't told a soul, and here someone comes up 
I could only guess that someone had seen me at the jewelry store and had started spreading a rumor on work. I hemmed and hawed and changed the subject, but I knew that I had it proposed quick before Lisa found out from somebody else. <laughs> at the time, the Chicago White Sox baseball team were in the playoffs, and Lisa and I had tickets for game five, so I decided that I was going to propose at game five. I was going to put a proposal on the center field scoreboard, like you've seen. It was going to say, Lisa Keenan, will you marry me? And everything was going according to plan until the White Sox lost their series to the Baltimore Orioles in four games. And <laughs> <laughs> come up with plan B. So on the Sunday that would have been game five, I decided to take Lisa to a restaurant and propose there. So I drove over to Fox Valley Shopping Center. And you know, I've never had very much of a poker face. And Lisa especially is very good at reading my feelings and expressions. That and the fact that I was wearing my best suit and tie, she knew something was up. <laughs> so I knew, but I couldn't make it into the restaurant. I finally proposed to her right there in the front seat of my Toyota Corolla in Fox Valley Shopping Center. <laughs> As an aside to those of you that experienced traffic today, you may not have been to Fox Valley Shopping Center, but if you drove here on 59, you drove past Fox Valley Shopping Center. <laughs> well, Lisa agreed to marry me, and we were planning on marry, getting married on October 27, 1984, at St. Peter and Paul Church right here in Naperville. Lisa wanted a September or October wedding, and the only other Saturday that was available at the church was October 13th. Neither one of us wanted to have future wedding anniversaries on Friday the 13th. Mm -hmm. But Lisa may have wished that she went with the 13th after all because October 27th was Halloween weekend. And I was unmercifully mean with the, <coughs> with the Halloween bridesmaids jokes. She'd worry about the, um, the bridal gowns, what color should we choose, what style should we choose, and I'd just tell her, don't worry about that. Just have them all come in costume. <laughs> I didn't appreciate all my jokes. As the wedding got closer, I decided that I wasn't going to let anything bother me on my wedding day. My motto was going to be, don't worry, be happy. At the time, I lived up north in Arlington Heights, and two of my groomsmen lived even further north. So the night before the wedding, in order to reduce the stress of possibly getting lost or being late, the three of us stayed in a hotel in Lyle so that we could be close and wouldn't have to worry about being late. And we had gotten our tuxedos from Genghis Formal Wear. And for those that haven't gotten tuxedos before, it was very convenient. We were each able to go to a separate Genghis Formal Wear store. We got measured, <clears throat> told them what wedding we were with, and then the day before the wedding, you go there and they give you the proper tuxedo for the wedding. At least that's the way it's supposed to work. <laughs> <laughs> the morning of my wedding, I was getting dressed in the hotel, and Tom comes up to me and says, Hey, Phil, are the groomsmen wearing the same tuxedo as the groom? I, I said, Yeah, we're all wearing black pants and black jackets. So then he holds up his tuxedo, and while well, it had a black jacket, it had black and white pinstripe pants. Mm. My heart skipped a beat, and I didn't know what to do. It was a Saturday morning, the stores weren't open. But then I realized, I'm not going to be able to fix this. I'm not going to let anything bother me on my wedding day. And I figured most people at a wedding are looking at the bride. They're not looking at the groomsmen. So we decided we would go with what we had. So we went to the church. And as is customary, the groom and the bride are getting ready in different rooms so that we don't see each other before the wedding. So I'm getting dressed again. And the priest, Father Michael Lane, comes in and asks me for the marriage license. And I said, well, Lisa has it. So he left. But a couple minutes later, he came back. So Lisa says that you have it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I, I did have it, or more accurately, I had had it the previous day. And I was pretty sure it was on my dresser in my apartment in Arlington Heights. <laughs> Probably a 90-minute round trip. There's no way I could have gotten there in time. But the priest was cool about it. He said he would marry us as long as we agreed to get him the license right after the ceremony. So the ceremony took place without any further problems. I had an usher that made a comment about the pinstripes and everybody laughed, but that went pretty well. Afterwards, I had had pictures taken with Lisa at the church, so I told Tom and Scott to go and get the marriage license from my, uh, from my apartment. Imagine if you can, 
Here's Tom and Scott, both in tuxedos, driving north on the Tri-State Tollway in a car that's got just married on the back. <laughs> <laughs> this is in 1984. <laughs> so they got back, they got back and saved the day. Everything, everything worked out okay there. A week later, Lisa and I got back from our honeymoon. I carried her over the threshold, carried her to the bedroom, plopped her on the bed, and heard a loud crunching noise. It turned out that Tom and Scott had dumped the whole box of Rice Krispies under the mattress. <laughs> and right then, I was thinking maybe I would change my motto from don't worry, be happy, to don't worry, get even. But I decided that, actually, I think I liked the way that my wedding turned out. It, it had character more than if it had just gone according to plan. So if life throws you a curve, don't worry, be happy. And you may not think that the wedding is suitable for a movie, but you've got to admit it's at least an episode of a sitcom. <laughs> <laughs> but if it was a movie, I actually went through the exercise of figuring who should play us in the movie. For me, James Franco, he used to have a mustache and I used to have a mustache. And for my wife, Gwyneth Paltrow. Mr. Toastmaster. <laughs> Contestant number four, Sean Kelly, golf, white play, golf, white play, Sean Kelly. Good afternoon, everybody. I want to talk about, by the way, who all plays golf in this room? Raise your hands, don't be shy. A lot of people do. I want to talk about my perspective of golf and why people play and other people's perspective playing golf too. Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and honored guests. You look at the word golf, when you think about it, it's not spelled properly. In fact, if you spell it backwards, you get the word flog. Because when people are playing golf, all they do all day is flog, 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 try to hit a golf ball, going crazy, swearing at themselves, just driving themselves nuts and everything too. Wouldn't you agree with that? Okay. In fact, one of the greatest golfers in the 1970s, 1980s, Ray Floyd, once said, the only reason why they call it golf is that all the other four-letter words are taken. <laughs> <laughs> I got my start playing golf, or understanding golf, when I was a kid. My parents were two of the biggest golf fanatics on the planet, okay? My dad would go out during the week and play golf with his associates in business for about four or five hours a day. Then the weekend comes along, he meets up with three of his buddies. He goes out and plays golf for another four or five hours on a Saturday. And then, on Sunday, him and my mom would meet up with another couple, and they go out and play another four or five hours of golf. But that was enough for my dad. You see, before he left with my mom, he'd take out you know, the old VHS tapes from the 80s, put it in the cassette recorder, and he'd record a golf tournament on television while he was out playing. So my mom and dad would finish playing golf, they'd come running back to the house, grab their food, sit down, and they'd turn the TV on, they would do what? Watch more? Oh. Yeah! They, they couldn't get enough of this. And I could never tell them who won the tournament because I could send to my room because they you know, can't tell us, can't tell us what to do. So, it's almost like people talk about golf and sex. It's the only two things in life 
that people love to do that they're not very good at. So, <laughs> so I just want to give you a little bit of history about golf, too. You know, golf was invented over 200 years ago in a country called Scotland by people called uh, Scots, I guess, what you want to call it. They were the ones who invented golf and call it a game. These are the same people who invented bagpipes and call it music. <laughs> They're also the same people that invented wool skirts that men have to wear called kilts. What do you think about that? In fact, I consulted one time with a gentleman who's a part-time historian and full-time comedian named Robin Williams. And he was talking with Scotsman to get his people to come to the game. So, Mr. Mr. Scotsman, what do you do with golf here? Ah, you take this ball and you hit it in the rabbit hole. Oh, just like pool. No, not pool. <laughs> no, you take a little crooked stick and you whack it into the golfer hole. Oh, like, like croquet. No, not croquet. You see, we take that rabbit hole and we put it hundreds of yards that way. So you have to take that stick out and hit it really hard and straight right toward the golfer hole. Oh, like bowling. No, not bowling. You see, we take trees and shrubs and tall grass. So when you're getting toward the golfer hole, you're whacking and whacking and whacking <laughs> till you give yourself a stroke. Ah, they call it a stroke because you hit it so hard you feel like you're gonna die when you get there. <laughs> but to give you some hope, we put it on a flat plane. That golfer hole, we stick a, a flag in there. But yeah, this is brilliant. You see, we put a pool here and sand over there, so you think you're getting close, but you're not getting close, and you just whack and whack and whack. So, Mr. Scott, can you do this, what, once a day? <laughs> no, 18 times in a day. <laughs> so I got a little bit older, and I started, my dad wanted me to play golf. Well, I'm from a family of seven people. He could only spend so much on golf and clubs, so he got me the cheapest clubs. We played the cheapest <laughs> golf courses and every time I lost a ball, he made me go get it and bring it back. Because golf balls cost money, right? Okay? So, he would take me out there. So it was one day, we were out playing golf. Beautiful day out, late summer. We're on this one hole looking about 200 yards down straight toward the, uh, toward the green. There's right next to the, the, green, or, uh, the fairway a corn field. And the corn stalks are about 8 feet high late summer stuff. There's a little bit of breeze coming out the cornfield, so in my infinite wisdom, smart little kid that I am, supposedly, I said, hey, Dad, what if I hit a little bit toward the uh, cornfield so that the wind will blow it back out of the fairway? Yeah, fine. You know everything. Go ahead and do it. So I hit it. I got up there, and I hit it. Boom! And I watched that thing sail so far, and I looked at my dad, and I said, boy, I hit the heck out of my dad. goes, you sure did hit it. Nice and long and straight into that cornfield. Now go get that ball and don't come back till you find it. Now he wasn't a bad guy. He gave me 10 bucks to get a cab ride home. So when I found the ball, I looked just kind of next to it. <laughs> Another comedian, Henny Young, remember him with the violins and the music and stuff? He said, one time I hit a couple of balls in a golf course. That's because I stepped on a brake. <laughs> <laughs> so my son and I are now picking up golf. We've been playing the last two years. And he's really getting into little things. Of course, we both bought and pull out together every day, you know, hitting the golf ball and things too. And I asked about a couple weeks ago, I asked him, I said, hey Tyler, what's your take on golf? He goes, you know, it's an easy sport to love, hard to hate. It's great at reducing stress, but it's so frustrating at times. <laughs> he said, the best time I'm at a golf course is when I'm at the first tee and I'm walking off the 18th hole. It's sort of like the day in the life of a boat owner. The two days, the best life of a boat owner. The first day is when you buy it, and the second day, we just sell it. That's how it goes. So I want to leave you with this one bit of information. Hank Aaron, remember Hank Aaron, one of the greatest baseball players of all time? He once said, you know, it took me 17 years to get 3,000 hits. It took me one afternoon playing golf to accomplish the same thing. That was faster than I was guessing.
Contestant number five, David Williams. Ways to tell your relationship is in trouble. Ways to tell your relationship is in trouble, David Williams. I'm here today to talk about what I think is a very serious topic, but it's also very sensitive. A topic that dates back to the days of the cave man, and not to be left out, the cave woman. Ways to tell that your relationship is in trouble. Since the very beginning of time, both men and women alike have always been able to look at other people's relationships and point out all the issues and flaws to let them know, hey, that relationship ain't gonna work out. However, those same people, they always point at you, <laughs> always miss the signs in their own relationship that their relationship is in trouble as well. Today I come to you not only as a member of Toastmasters, but as what I like to call myself the foremost leading expert in troubled relationships. <laughs> <laughs> Don't laugh at my experience. I know some of you are probably saying, well, how can one guy have so much knowledge about troubled relationships? What school must he have attended to receive his doctor degree in bad relationships? And the answer to that is simple. Experience University. I'm the only person that ever graduated. What I would like to do now is just list a few ways for you to tell that your relationship is in trouble. If you've ever heard the phrase, I think we need to take a break. Understand this isn't a normal break. This is the break you get at work the last 15, and in my case sometimes a little bit longer, 20 minutes where you get up, stretch your legs, eat your little peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and you go back to your desk, start working again. For those of you that have kids, you know, when your child gets hired, the coach pulls them out of the game, they get a break, they go back in. But when your mate tells you, I think we need to take a break, it's gonna be the longest break of your life. <laughs> <laughs> Understand that what they're really trying to tell you when they say, I think we need to take a break, is the following. Write it down if you like. Please, lose my telephone number. <laughs> Understand that as soon as I get in front of a computer, I am going to unfriend you on Facebook. <laughs> Please, take down all of our photos off of Instagram. Stop following me on Twitter. And the most important thing to remember is have a nice life. <laughs> the next way to tell that your relationship is in trouble is if your mate tells you, I just need some time to find myself. I don't know about you, but I've heard this phrase more times than I really care to discuss right now. <laughs> that probably be a, that's a, a different meeting topic, I'm sure. I definitely won't be in the, uh, the couple's Toastmasters club anytime soon. <laughs> Understand that when your, your mate tells you, I just need some time to find my break, I just need time uh, for myself, that this is probably the most condescending phrase ever told to anybody else. I've been to many of lost and founds in my day, and never once has my mate told me, hey, sweetie, look, I found myself over here. We can go back to the way things were. It's, it's never going to happen. Trust me, I've tried. When your mate tells you, I just need some time to find myself, Understand that your relationship is in trouble. Now there is some truth to that statement. There's a second part to that phrase that's never told. And this is how it goes. I just need some time to find myself another person today. <laughs> <laughs> now the first two scenarios I've outlined for you haven't really led you to believe that your relationship is in trouble. Let me assure you, stop laughing. <laughs> let me assure you that this next one will all but let you know that it is definitely time for you to move on. Now I need a little uh, audience participation. I need everyone to repeat after me. So what are you trying to tell me? So what are you trying to tell me? No, you have to say it with some emotion, like it means something to you. So what are you trying to tell me? So what are you trying to tell me? Congratulations. If you've ever said this phrase, you are now the proud owner of a restraining order. <laughs>
<laughs> Understand, ladies and gentlemen, that the person you are with thought so much of you that they've taken time out of their day to go sit in front of a judge and have a little piece of paper signed that has been hand delivered to you by the county sheriff. Again, I'm the only one that's graduated from experience <laughs> university. So understand that these are just experiences that have come my way. I understand that this restraining order supersedes the, I think we need to take a break. It supersedes, I just need some time to find myself. I've been in a lot of relationships. I would like to say mostly good. Uh, probably not though, based on this story. <laughs> <laughs> but understand that in the event that you receive this restraining order and you say, well, God, how can you misinterpret the fact that you got a restraining order? That's the number one sign that your relationship is going down the drain. Well, let me tell you, you can misinterpret it. It can be done. And usually when it's misinterpreted, it means one of three things. A, maybe I should just try a little bit harder to let them know how much I really care. <laughs> <laughs> B, Oh, so you think I'm crazy, but you ain't seen crazy yet. <laughs> or C, maybe it wasn't a good idea that I kept showing up uninvited to his house, his parents' house, his grandparents' house, and the other three dozen places that he's never told me he's mentioned. But I always manage to be there when he's there. Understand that if you cannot take anything else away from this speech, it's not your fault. The other phrase that I've also heard is, it's not you, it's me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That is the conclusion of the contestants for the human speech competition. We'll give our judges the time they need to fill in their ballots. Thank you. 
the Toastmaster. We have all the ballots. Thank you. What I'd like to do is thank you for the ballot comments. When they're counting the ballots, I'd like to ask each of the contestants uh, to come up and we'll do a quick interview with each of them. So please uh, join us. <laughs> Better 
I, he's recording this, so I don't <laughs> 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 Okay, they're much, much better. Right, they're much, yeah, much yeah, better. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, see, it's kind of our understanding what people really mean as Dave was talking about. Right. Their fine means are much, much better. Right. Okay? right. Uh, you read biographies. What kind of biographies? I like reading biographies of presidents. I've gone through the, if you've read any of the, the McCullough books, he's read, yeah. written on uh, John Adams and Harry Truman. Mm. I found those two good to read together because one of them is sort of, well, they're, they're a different type of yeah. uh, character. John Adams is sort of like a typical Republican today, and Truman is like a typical Democrat, but you end up liking each of them in their own way. Right, yeah. Good stuff. And uh, do you read a lot of biographies, or is it just kind of one uh, every? Well, I've, I've, tried, kind of I've tried to learn about the different presidents. I've read the, His Excellency about Washington, and the different books about, I've read books about probably 20 or 25 of the presidents. I, I just got done with a, a biography of uh, Richard J. Daly in Chicago. Right. Interesting to read about that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. Well, Philip, thanks very much for competing today. We wish you very much. College out in Aurora. Right, okay. How long have you been a member of Toastmasters? I think since about 2007. Right, uh, okay. And have you, have you competed in previous competitions? Uh, this is my first time competing in a number of competitions, yes. Right. Actually, no, I did a, a table tennis one about two years ago. Right, okay, all right. And um, apart from uh, golf, you also like, is it hiking? Is that hiking, yes. Hiking yes. and scuba diving? Yes. So did you take up the hiking after you lost so many golf balls and looking for the golf balls? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah I, I gave my legs a really good workout, so now all the walking around looking for golf balls, I'm able to say, it's only for golf ball. I think I'll hit that trail up there and just keep falling and right. see what's up there. Right. What kind of hikes do you do? Is it just around the neighborhood or the page area? Or well, I can do some hikes around here. I also like to bike riding, too. Uh, my favorite area to hike is in Colorado. There's a trail just west of Boulder. It's about about a mile long and about 1,200 square uh, foot elevation on that too. But you get to the top, you're looking straight down at Boulder, you're looking at Denver over here, and the Great Plains below you. It's, it's, it's spectacular. Yeah. yeah. And what would a good hike be for you in terms of miles? Well, I would say something like that. You know, yeah. it's the elevation. The, the length, uh, how many miles would you do on a long hike? A oh, long hike? I, I did one time years ago in the Rocky Mountains about 13 miles. Okay, good stuff. All right. Well, thanks a minute for competing. Yeah. Yeah.
in the home. Right. Um, that and the fact that a lot of the judges are tired of signing off on the foreclosure. They're like, hey, you got to stop. Yeah, I mean, it's just not us. It's just a lot of the banks, too. They're saying, hey, you got to slow down. So. Right. Yeah. So David wants us to know, don't blame the banks, okay? <laughs> <laughs> David, thank you very much for participating. got plenty of stuff going, so don't worry. I can get a still out of this at any time. Okay, uh, all quarter minutes taken? All right, let's go to the humorous speech competition. Helga's friend, Cassie. <laughs> <laughs> 